Hello, I'm Jacqueline Moline, Chair of Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology and Prevention at Hofstra North Shore LIJ School of Medicine at Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. Welcome to this program titled Advances in the Screening and Treatment of World Trade Center Responders and Survivors. The goals of the program today are to identify types of environmental exposures that can affect health following a disaster or terrorist attack, summarize the ways in which environmental exposure science can inform public health policy before and after a disaster, and identify immediate and long-term health needs of exposed populations following disasters using the lessons we've learned from the World Trade Center Health Program population. Before we begin our discussion, please take a moment to test your knowledge on this topic by answering a few questions. You will have another chance to answer these questions at the end of the activity to see what you've learned. There are several types of environmental exposures. They can occur from natural disasters or events precipitated by humans, such as terrorism or corporate or government negligence. Examples of natural disasters are things like earthquakes and hurricanes. Man-made disasters include the terrorist attacks that affected the World Trade Center on September 11th, and other events such as the Indian Bhopal gas disaster. Now the World Trade Center dust had several constituents that have led to many of the health effects that we're seeing and we'll be talking about in this program. There were a variety of compounds from the structural collapse, from the cement, ceiling tiles, drywall, from the windows, the fire retardant, the combustion, the products of combustion, and the diesel-powered rescue equipment. Many of these constituents led to different compounds such as calcium carbonate, gypsum, asbestos, glass fibers, silicates, hydrocarbons, dioxins, and diesel exhaust. The health effects, which we'll be talking about in detail in this program, include airway and pulmonary irritation, cancers, and other health effects. Now, what we're going to talk about are lessons that we've learned from prior disasters and how we can use that to inform us and move forward. We will talk about medical and psychological surveillance, exposure assessment, and the mental health consequences of disasters. Using our World Trade Center surveillance programs as an example, we'll talk about the programs today. This includes our screening and monitoring program, which was initially designed to identify responders with possible World Trade Center health effects and provide appropriate referral for follow-up diagnostic testing and treatment. The treatment programs of the World Trade Center programs developed and integrated both physical and mental health treatment. There were limits in the coverage of care and they provided challenges for both the provider and the patient. To give you a timeline on the establishment of the programs, it's important to go back and talk about how this program was initially set up. In April 2002, the World Trade Center Worker and Volunteer Medical Program started. Initially, it was a one-year program only. It was sent, then extended to two years because of the demand for services. In March 2004, it became the World Trade Center Medical Monitoring Program with five-year funding that was eventually extended for two additional years. In 2006, on the fifth anniversary, federal funding for treatment of World Trade Center conditions began and the program was renamed the World Trade Center Medical Monitoring and Treatment Program. Now, every state has World Trade Center health program participants. If you look, you'll see that there's representation from every state in both the responder and survivor programs, which we'll be discussing in detail later in this program. The majority of responders come from the New York metropolitan area. As you can see, there are about 54,000 participants. But overall, in the programs, there have been over 60,000 responders, almost 8,000 survivors, and a total program participation to date of 68,142 individuals. There were a number of components that began in the World Trade Center medical monitoring programs that were for both medical and psychological screening. These components of the program included self and interviewer administered medical questionnaires, and a physician administered examination, exposure assessment that was interviewer administered through a questionnaire, 
psychological screening and evaluation, spirometry done with pre and post bronchodilator, chest x-rays, and routine blood work. When we think about the exposure assessment from the disaster, there are several lessons that we've learned. There needed to be earlier testing of ambient exposures at the site and nearby. There should have been more of a focus on toxicants other than asbestos. There should have been testing of indoor settings to establish a gradient of exposure with distance from ground zero that would help guide recommendations, whether it was in the settled dust or from aggressive air monitoring. There needed to be consistent messaging on cleanup procedures. Other elements of exposure assessment included access to follow-up medical and mental health care that was difficult for World Trade Center problems because of issues related to workers' compensation delays and few occupational specialists who were aware of the disaster. For the World Trade Center mental and behavioral health problems, the population was very heterogeneous. There were a few psychiatrists or other mental health providers that were familiar with the nuances of World Trade Center experience. And there's a need for mental health experts that speak a variety of languages, including Polish, Mandarin, Spanish, and other languages. These were the languages spoken by many of the responders at the World Trade Center site. There are a number of recommendations that have come from surveillance and environmental exposure science that help us inform public policy. The first recommendation is to have medical surveillance to, ex to identify exposures and early symptoms of disease to link those findings to individual care and preventive interventions. The overall goals of surveillance are to prevent and mitigate adverse physical and mental and behavioral health outcomes, and also to assess and maintain worker functionality. A second recommendation is related to mental health surveillance. This also is required to assess and maintain worker functionality and to prevent and mitigate adverse mental health outcomes. A registry should be created of all the workers at the site. And a fourth recommendation includes a centralized mechanism to capture the data related to the individual and collective exposures so that we can facilitate individual treatment, preventive interventions, and future long-term public health needs. There are additional recommendations which include exposure assessment strategies that are developed under incident command systems as a way to protect workers on the job and these should be integrated with medical psychological surveillance programs to help guide interventions. Each individual worker should receive a detailed and interpreted biomedical and exposure data. These results should also include de-identified surveillance and exposure data for all, including the public, provided to the workers and interpreted appropriately. A seventh recommendation is critical, which is that risk communication needs to be an integral part of the entire worker protection program, including surveillance. So what are these health needs that developed over time? Let's talk about the example of the World Trade Center health effects. The immediate needs were related to cough, congestion, chest tightness, eye irritation, and musculoskeletal injuries in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Short-term medical conditions included asthma, throat and sinus and, and nasal irritation, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, and post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Long-term medical problems include the World Trade Center cough syndrome, asthma, COPD, rhinosinusitis, GERD, autoimmune disorders, cancer, and PTSD that still persist. Many of the common disorders and complaints related to the World Trade Center include respiratory problems of asthma, shortness of breath, and chronic cough, GERD, a very common symptom for, related to both acid and non-acid reflux, allergies, skin problems, and over 50 cancer types with elevations seen particularly in prostate cancer rates, thyroid cancer, multiple myeloma, and lymphoma. Common mental health disorders seen among World Trade Center exposed individuals include PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, 
substance abuse, especially with tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, and opiates, and other symptoms that we've seen include insomnia, headaches, memory attention problems, interpersonal difficulties, and chronic pain syndromes. The World Trade Center Health Registry was begun in approximately 2002, and this was a questionnaire-based survey with 71,437 people enrolled for about 17.4% coverage of the estimated eligible exposed population. This population was over 400,000 and included building occupants, persons on the street in transit in Lower Manhattan on September 11th, local residents, rescue and recovery workers and volunteers, and school children and staff. Many of the folks participating in the World Trade Center Health Registry reported being in the dust cloud from the collapsing World Trade Center towers. In fact, over 51% of them were in the dust cloud. 70% of them witnessed traumatic events, and 13% of people responding in the World Trade Center Health Registry sustained an injury. After September 11, 67% of the adult enrollees reported new or worsening respiratory symptoms, and 3% had newly diagnosed asthma by a physician. It was most seen in the rescue and recovery workers who worked in the debris pile. 16% of folks in the World Trade Center Health Registry registered positive for probable post-traumatic stress disorder, and 8% for serious psychological distress. PTSD was higher among some groups, including those who had a lower household income, those who were injured, and many who were of Hispanic ethnicity. It was estimated that between 3,800 and 12,600 adults experienced newly diagnosed asthma, and 34,000 to 70,000 adults experienced PTSD following the attacks, showing the sheer scope of folks affected after this man-made disaster. This graph shows new onset respiratory symptoms in previously normal exposed residents in Lower Manhattan. You can see that over 25% had symptoms compared to only 7% in those who were not exposed. These symptoms included cough, chest tightness, shortness of breath, exertional dyspnea, or wheeze. The survivor population, which included building reoccupants, local residents, school children, and those who lived in Lower Manhattan, included symptoms related to cough, wheeze, dyspnea on exertion, chest tightness, and sinus and nasal problems. The prevalence of symptoms in the, in the lower respiratory tract among World Trade Center responders included many of the same findings as those who were in the survivor program, the building reoccupants and residents. This included cough, shortness of breath, wheeze, chest tightness, and if we look at the combination of any lower respiratory symptom, we see that the rates of symptoms was nearly 44 percent. In a look back after nine years, the cumulative incidence of illnesses in the World Trade Center rescue and recovery workers of nearly 27,500 individuals included asthma in 27.6% of responders, sinusitis in over 42% of responders, GERD in almost 40% of responders, and abnormal spirometry in 42% of responders. The predominant finding was a low force vital capacity, which was seen in 75% of individuals with abnormal spirometry. With respect to mental health conditions, PTSD was seen in the police and other responders at different rates. For the police, it was about 9.3%, and for all other responders, it was nearly 32%. Panic disorder was seen in 21% of the general responders and in 8.4% of the police. Depression rates were seen in 27.5% of the responders in general and in 7% of the police. GERD in the World Trade Center population has been a persistent and common problem related to a variety of other symptoms. And this graphic shows the interrelationship with many of the symptoms and problems that we've been seeing in this population, whether it be chest pain, cough, bronchial asthma, 
hoarseness, laryngitis, dyspepsia, nausea and vomiting, or Barrett's esophagus, which has the potential to lead to esophageal cancer. Other diseases have shown up at increased rates, and this includes sarcoid-like granulomatous pulmonary disease, which was described in both the fire department and in the responder population, and that showed that sarcoidosis in in annual incidence rates in the fire department were elevated after September 11th. The fire department compared rates 15 years prior to 9-11 and five years after the disaster. In the five years after 9-11, 26 firefighters presented with new onset sarcoidosis, 13 of whom were diagnosed in the first year. Their findings now were consistent with asthma, and many of them had airway hyperreactivity. This had not been seen in the pre-World Trade Center sarcoidosis cases in the fire department. When they looked at the incidence rates, the 15-year prior incidence was 15 per 100,000, but in one year after 9-11, it had jumped to 86 per 100,000. The rate declined in the two to five years after 9-11, but still remained elevated at 22 per 100,000. One of the important elements of the World Trade Center medical programs has been an assessment of ongoing mental health. In looking at over 10,000 World Trade Center workers who completed self-administered mental health questionnaires in the 10 to 61 months after the World Trade Center attack, 11% had criteria for probable PTSD, 88 had criteria for probable depression, 5% had criteria for probable panic disorder, and 62% met criteria for substantial stress reaction. Extensive comorbidity was observed and included high rates of impairment of social function. Chronic impairment of mental health and social functioning is associated with the service in 9-11 recovery operations. When we looked at the mental health effects among the different responders, and we looked at the difference between police officers responding and non-traditional responders, we saw stark differences. For example, fewer police than non-traditional responders had probable PTSD with rates from 5.9% among police officers to 23% among non-traditional responders. Respiratory symptoms were somewhat similar, with 22.5% in the police and 28% in the non-traditional responders. There was exposure that was more associated with respiratory symptoms than PTSD or lung function. Some of the Hypotheses for between this difference is that they're screening for police officers prior to participating in police work, and also they undergo training and drills that might mitigate some of these longer term effects. When we look at the World Trade Center Health Program, as it is now called, the responders include those involved in rescue recovery and debris removal, as well as volunteers at the site. They underwent medical and mental health screening, monitoring and treatment programs, and the presence of symptoms was not necessary to be eligible in the program. The Survivors Program and the World Trade Center Environmental Health Center included the community members, the local workers, building reoccupants, residents, students, and cleanup workers. Medical mental health treatment uh, was included in these programs for World Trade Center related medical and mental health symptoms and cancers. Medical and mental health monitoring was available once people were enrolled in the program, and the presence of symptoms or cancers was necessary to be program eligible. There have been a number of other registries that have developed. We talked about the World Trade Center Health Registry, which was a health survey that was sent to those directly exposed to the events of 9-11. Other registries that have developed include the Katrina and Rita Exposure Registry. There's a National ALS Registry and a Rapid Response Registry, which is designed to help local, state, and federal public health and disaster response agencies rapidly establish registries for people who are exposed or potentially exposed to chemicals and other agents during catastrophic events. So what are some lessons that we've learned? environmental disasters, maybe natural or man-made, 
there are high rates of comorbid medical and mental health conditions in rescue workers and survivors with environmental health disasters. There's a need for integrated mental and physical health care, and we must account for the psychological burden of chronic medical illness in those impacted by disasters. The importance of ongoing surveillance even decades after a disaster is critical. There should be a comprehensive safety and health risk assessment at the onset of an incident. Sampling results should be reported in a methodological and diligent manner. There should be a variety of methods used to protect workers. Safety and health training should be provided to affected workers, employers, and other agencies. A multidisciplinary approach is needed for disaster programs. And most importantly, referrals to the World Trade Center Health Program can and should still be made for those affected by the World Trade Center disaster. I'd like to thank you for participating in this activity. Please click on the Earn CME CE Credit link to revisit the questions presented at the beginning of the activity and see what you've learned. The CME CE post-test and evaluation will follow.